Hello and welcome. We are delighted to kick off a new year and a new focus for our New York State of Wine webinar series. Uh, this year, this three-part series will focus on the theme of the elements, where we will explore elements most integral to the wine regions of New York, earth, water, and wine. So today we focus on earth, uh, exploring the diverse terroirs of New York's growing regions, which offer winemakers a dynamic home for countless varieties. So um, many of you I know are tasting along with us uh, and you have your tasting kits there. And um, for the rest of you, I hope you enjoy this conversation. I know most of you are webinar pros by now, but I will share a few housekeeping notes. Uh, there are two communication methods available to participants. You have a chat section and then a Q and A section. So the chat section is that informal way for you to communicate amongst yourselves. And then the Q&A is where we're going to pull questions um, to pose to the panelists. So our host today uh, is Jamie Good. Jamie is a London-based wine writer who is currently wine columnist with UK national newspaper, The Sunday Express. And he is also the author of the book, Wine Science. As well as writing, he also lectures and judges wine. And joining Jamie today is our panel. Uh, we have uh, Kareem Masood of Pominock Vineyards, Morton Hallgren of Ravines Wines, and Kelby James Russell of Red Newt Wine Cellars. So I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to Jamie to start the conversation. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with three um, of the star wineries of New York wine, which I think is always good when we've got great wines to taste. Um, we've got some really lovely wines to get cracking into. Uh, and so a lot of the chat we'll have will be around the wines and we'll introduce some of the topics. But um, as Katie said, the subject today is earth. And personally speaking, I'm fascinated by the relationship between soils and wines. I know when I started writing about wine, um, ironically, that picture um, that was up just now, the bio picture of me was taken in 2009 in Burgundy. So that's 14 years old. So <laughs> no, I didn't supply it. I don't, I'm not one of these people who uses 14 year old pictures um, when I'm most pictures. But yeah, I mean, back then, I'm, we were talking much less about soils and wine. And now we're talking a lot about soils and wine, trying to make that connection between what is it about the place? I mean, obviously the climate's very important. Um, but what is it about the place where the climate's the same for lots of different vineyards, but the different vineyards can produce wines that taste, you know, quite startlingly different. And that's one of the great mysteries of wine. And that's one of the things we'll be trying to get to grips with here is that relationship between, you know, as we taste the wines, we'll be asking, well, what are the soils in these, in these two regions like? Um, and how is it that those soils are dictating, first of all, what styles of wines are made? Um, secondly, which varieties are planted, I guess. And thirdly, you know, how those soils influence flavor. Um, and as we go through the wines, I'll also ask the, the three winemakers to introduce um, their own particular project and property. But first of all, just a quick overview of New York State as it relates to wine. Katie, could you put the, the slide up that um, shows the different regions? So as you can see there, there are a few regions, but the two that we're really most concerned about here and the two which are, I guess, arguably the most significant in New York State are Finger Lakes right in the middle there. As you can see, there's a series of lakes running roughly north to south that, that look a bit like fingers. That's why the name's called that, the, the region's called that. And that's um, producing quite a bit of the, the notable wine that's coming from New York State. And then we're also today, we're heading down to Long Island and we're just chatting that it's quite a schlep down there. If you wanted to drive there, it would take you, I don't know, depending on the traffic in the city, it would take you um, maybe 10 or 11 hours to get from, from um, Kareem's property up to the Finger Lakes. And so Kareem and Palmanook is on the North Fork of Long Island. So Long Island's at the bottom there, just to the right of New York City, sticking out into um, Long Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean. And, Significantly for both regions, you can see there's water and water is really important for both regions because it acts as a, a sort of radiator or a thermal modulator. 
So it keeps the summers a little bit cooler because the summers can get pretty warm and humid in both regions. Um, but most importantly, perhaps it moderates the winter lows. And we'll be discussing a little bit about that later. So if we can leave that slide, I'd like us to go straight to the first wine. And um, Karim, could you tell us a little bit about Palmanuk and also the, why we're tasting a, a, a variety that might surprise people here um, straight off the bat? And um, we're heading to Chenin Blanc. So uh, Chenin Blanc is something, uh, a wine we've been producing since 1992, so 30 vintages now. And uh, we planted it, uh, actually we didn't plant it. It came with a property that my parents gambled on in the mid eighties, someone else had planted this vineyard across the street from my parents' own vineyard. And um, it, Chenin Blanc was not part of their original game plan. And uh, uh, we had a German uh, vineyard manager at the time who, who uh, it was, you know, we, we, we didn't, my parents didn't live on the property full time yet at that time. And uh, this gentleman, Uwe Michelfeld, he, he was convinced that the Shannon uh, w looked healthy and was thriving. And he spoke to my father, Charles, and he said, Charles, you know, the Shannon looks happy and healthy. Why don't you give it a chance? And my father said, well, you know, I'm running out of time. So maybe I'll, maybe Uva's right. Let's, let's give it a chance. And, and long story short, he just we decided to keep it. And it's turned into, um, one of our most successful, one of our most popular wines. But now that we have the benefit of all these uh, years and decades of hindsight, it seems almost logical. And I say that because we've had really good outcomes with other Loire varieties like Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. And so not, you know, some, somewhat unsurprisingly, the Chenin Blanc also does very well. Um, and uh, just recently, a couple of years ago, using that same sort of logic, we, we we added an acre of Melon de Bourgogne, which I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, hopefully next year will be the first uh, harvest of that new variety for us. And I believe that might make us the only winery in New York State growing four Loire varieties. Um, That's fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit more about Long Island, just for the benefit of those who haven't visited or heard about it more? Um, and specifically where you are, the North Fork. Yeah. So um, the key thing to begin with is it is actually an island. As you can see here, we are very much surrounded by water. Uh, we have these large bodies of water, including the Atlantic Ocean, which is only about uh, you know, six to eight miles away, depending on where exactly you are in the North Fork. Uh, and then where we are, we're only half a mile as the crow flies from the bay, from the Peconic Bay, and about two and a half to three miles from the Long Island Sound. So we do very much have a maritime climate, as you were saying earlier, Jamie. And um, so as, as my father says, uh, we produce island wines. <clears throat> and so, you know, what do you think of when you hear that? It's, it's sort of evocative of, of, of the natural things you think about like seafood. And so a lot of our white wines are right in that sort of 11, 12, 12 and a half percent alcohol range and have excellent acidity. And they're, they're great with the seafood that we're lucky to land on our shores. Climatically, what are we looking at in terms of, um, you know, the growing season, um, how hot does it get, and what are the winters like? So uh, we, we do get enough, you know, heat, heat accumulation to ripen varieties, uh, including Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot, which are, of course, late ripeners. Uh, but, you know, there are going to be some years where there's not quite enough heat to, to fully ripen those. And so, um, but the growing season typically begins in uh, late April, first week of May. And then we're harvesting whites throughout the month of September and reds in October. You know, with, with climate change, that's, uh, uh, it's hard to use the word normal anymore, but that historically that's sort of had the, the, the span of the, the length of the season. Um, and is, is it quite humid there? What's, I mean, just getting at sort of what sort yeah. of challenges there might be for growing yes. wine grapes, because the climate sounds pretty good, but um, does it get humid? Uh, yes, so that, that, is, uh, that is the number one challenge, the perennial challenge we face on Long Island is we do have this sort of perennial humidity. It's not a question of will it be humid, the question is how humid will it be and for how long? 
And that's typically the month of July, like late June going into July and then into August, we can have these spells of humidity. Uh, and some years it's more pronounced than others. But um, so like I said, that really is a perennial phenomena that we have to contend with. But you know, as a result, over the decades, we've adapted our viticulture where um, you know, in many parts of the world, it's a good idea to maintain an open and airy canopy. On Long Island, it's really essential. I mean, uh, there's almost really, I'll go, I'll go so far as to say there's no other way. I mean, if, if you're not doing that, you're asking for trouble in terms of, of disease and mildew. And so we're very meticulous and diligent about maintaining an open and airy canopy. And we also do pretty uh, aggressive leaf removal. We're removing yeah. the leaves in front of the fruit so that the fruit can see the sun and feel the wind. You want it to be well ventilated and to get the UV light from the sun right onto the fruit to knock out some of that downy mildew and powdery mildew uh, inoculum. And the topic of this um, seminar is um, earth. So what sort of earth do you have? What sort of soils? Long Island was created during the last ice age. And when the glaciers receded, it left this moraine field uh, where we have these uh, really uh, alluvial soils. And um, one thing that's notable about Long Island, and, and if you're a wine connoisseur, a wine lover, one thing that'll strike you as being maybe out of place is how flat it is. It's very flat. The topography is quite flat for the most part. But so the reason we exist as a fine wine region is because the, the, the soils truly drain exceptionally well. And that's because we have a sandy, gravelly subsoil and, and a sandy loam for most of the, to the topsoils. Uh, in some places, you know, the soils uh, are a little bit heavier here and there, here and there, there's some clay. But for the most part, it's a sandy loam with sandy, gravelly subsoils. And uh, yeah, the, 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 even if we have a, a major rain event, you rarely ever see standing water in the field. Uh, because it's like a giant sieve. The water just drains right through. So the, they truly drain uh, very well. And there's a question from one of the um, participants, and that is how much Chenin Blanc is there in um, Long Island? So uh, at Pamanac, we're up to, um, we just planted a four acre vineyard. So now we're up to about 14, 15 acres at Pamanac. And uh, just fairly recently, we have a couple other uh, vineyards who have planted, um, uh, I believe in total about another five acres or so. So it's not a whole lot, um, yeah. but, uh, but we have been doing it for, like I said, for 30 years at Pamana. And um, is anywhere else planting it? And, and, sorry, is anyone planting it anywhere else in the state or is it just, it's not something, would it have to be in a, the more benign sort of Long Island area to, to thrive? I, I can't really speak to that as well. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, but I'll let uh, Morton Kelby answer that one. Morton or Kelby, is, do you know of anyone who's planted Shena in um, Finger Lakes? I know there's some attempts, and I also know they tried it on the Canadian side. On the Canadian side, they pretty much abandoned the idea. But I, I do think there are a couple of people uh, testing it out in the Finger Lakes, but it, it would yeah. be a challenge here. And just tasting the wine, it's got that beautiful characteristic acidity of Chenin. Um, it's really um, vibrant. 7.3 grams a liter tartaric um, equivalent. That's um, reasonably high acid, yeah? Um, yeah. But it's countered beautifully by uh, just a touch of residual sugar. Um, it feels dry, but it just kind of adds a little balance there. So. So my father calls this Venus lemonade. If wine could be lemonade or vice versa, it might taste something like this. It's very citric in nature and it has this sweet and sour character. And what's really amazed me over the many years we've been producing it is um, it has this really broad appeal. People who don't know wine are love it. And, and all the way up the, the, the whole gamut of, of people who, who love wine. I mean, even people who are, who are the wine nerds of the world and the um also uh, are into this wine and really the only people who don't like it are if you're not a fan of high acid white wines but uh it really has this broad appeal and i think that has a little to do with the that sweet and sour character like in that sort of refreshing 
And you know, once it's chilled in an ice bucket and the in the summer, you get the sensational aspect, just like lemonade, thirst quenching, refreshing. And it's only 11% alcohol. So it's easy, easy to drink, uh, drink half a bottle or a bottle. Hmm. So do you ferment to dryness or do you just stop it just before the last bit of sugar is being used up? It's, um, it's interesting. I mean, um, I, I just let it fizzle out. And so it doesn't ferment to dryness on its own. I'm not stopping it. I mean, rarely. Uh, it's, uh, occasionally I might turn on the refrigeration to really put on the brakes, but it usually kind of just fizzles out with the RS. And so we usually end up with eight, 10, 12, or 14 grams uh, per liter of resi residual sugar. And over the years as a winemaker, I've learned that uh, uh, you really need to let the wine be what it wants to be. Don't push it in a direction that it doesn't want to go. Like, so I, I'm, I'm usually content to just leave it wherever it goes. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, lovely wine. So let's move on to the Finger Lakes and wine number two. And this is Ravines. And it's the White Springs Vineyard Dry Riesling 2020. So Morton, um, yes. looking at your CV, it's fascinating. You have you came from a classical sort of European wine um, background. I mean, you, you did a spell at, was it Costa d'Estournel as well? You worked there and then, then you moved to the States and you did, you went to, you had a spell at, um, was it Asheville in North Carolina, um, which is an unusual place to me, and Texas as well. So you've kind of, you've done the classical European, then you've done um, the sort of like the, the slightly, maybe slightly, slightly esoteric United States um, um, regions. And then you moved to um, Dr. Frank at um, Finger Lakes, where you must have got a really good overview of of the whole place. Can you tell us a bit about ravines and what you're doing there? Sure. No, you're absolutely right. It's a little different here from the family estate back in Provence where, where it all started. And uh, when I came to the Finger Lakes with my wife, Lisa, back in, in 99, I, I took the job at, at Constantine Frank, which is what brought us to the region. And it didn't take very long to sort of see the the fascination of the Finger Lakes region and within a year we we bought our first property and decided to set down in in, in this region and we decided um, to to start ravines and the name itself derives from the the glacial formation of the of the lakes of Cuca Lake in particular where we where we started out and ravines has kind of changed dramatically since we started 20 years ago where we started working with grapes from uh, vineyards that I'd come to know mostly during my my stay at uh, Constantine Franks as their head winemaker and now we've evolved to farming 120 acres of our own so we're about 80% estate grown and we work with one outside vineyard, uh, which is the Argetsinger vineyard, which we will also be, be tasting here today. And with an emphasis on dry wines, um, we're showing two Rieslings today, but we do make a, about a third of our production is red wine, which is not, not insignificant. And looking at that map of the, the Finger Lakes, could you just talk us very quickly, if we can go back to that map, just talk us through the, the most significant of the lakes and and explain where why the lakes are so important for the region and, and absolutely so if it wasn't for these lakes it would undoubtedly be too cold to grow the vinifera grapes in the finger lakes they basically serve uh, as a reservoir of heat extending the growing season both in the spring and in the fall. So we end up with a long enough growing season to be able to grow and to ripen the vinifera varieties. And that basically means that the vinifera growing is confined to a fairly narrow band around each lake, anywhere from uh, a mile to maybe a little over a mile wide uh, on the first slope. So the cold air drains out of the vineyard area and you still have that moderating effect on the lake. So uh, it keeps it very, uh, very well defined area where you can grow 
vinifera grapes. And then in between the lakes further away, you can grow the native and the hybrid grapes that coexist with vinifera in our region. That makes it a very interesting region, doesn't it? Presumably, because I guess you've got a, other regions where maybe in the past there would have been a lot of hybrids and natives that have been squeezed out by vinifera, but here the vinifera can't intrude too far into, into where they're planted. So they'll always be, I guess, uh, you know, both coexisting together, which is really interesting. But, but um, you know, considering that the, the narrow range for vinifera, um, I guess another factor also is that different varieties of vinifera show different abilities to survive the winter lows. So presumably, is that one of the reasons you think Riesling has been so well established? Because Riesling has this, this special ability to, to kind of like, it just seems to be bomb-proof. Um, well, not totally bomb-proof, but compared with other viniferas. No, you're absolutely right. We all like to harvest grapes every year. Um, <laughs> and we have a, a great resource, which is Cornell University in, in our area. And they've done extensive studies over the years to kind of determine the minimum temperatures fully dormant bud will handle in, in the winter time. And by that, you can kind of categorize the, the risk level of different varieties, Riesling and Cabernet Franc being the safest varieties to grow. And then it kind of goes down to the riskier varieties like Wurzstraminer and Merlot. And then of course you have all of the other varieties that few or nobody would consider growing in the Finger Lakes that are better suited to, to milder climates. So uh, yes, there's quite a, quite a bit of selection taking place in what varieties you can grow here. And you also have to develop a certain comfort with risk. I don't think you can grow grapes and make wine in the, in the Finger Lakes if you're really risk adverse. Mm. So, um... Going back to the topic of the the, the seminar Earth, um, how are these soils formed? And obviously, you're in a position where you've got a, you say you've got 120 acres of vineyard, which is a significant amount, presumably in in many different plots. Um, how much variation do you see? And do you think there are some soils that have got special talent for Riesling, that they're really the sort of the Grand Cru sites? And how would they be differentiated? Absolutely. So. Um, most of the Finger Lakes has uh, acidic soil, uh, low pH soil, especially to the south, uh, but up towards uh, the northern part of the region, getting closer to Lake Ontario, as well as certain pockets, you do find uh, limestone soils as well. Um, you have the, basically the extension of the bench coming from Niagara Falls and from the Canadian wine region. So, when we came to the region in 99, there was a great availability of grapes, a surplus, you might say. So between that and, and, and my time working at Constantine Frank, I had a chance to survey through many different vineyards and make selections of, of different sites. And uh, we ended up choosing uh, a few different sites. We have uh, four main vineyard sites, White Springs uh, in the very northern end of Seneca Lake, which is firmly on that limestone uh, trench up there. Uh, and then a more traditional shale stone at our 16 Falls Vineyard, about halfway down Seneca Lake, and then Cuca Lake again, also shale stone. And the Argensinger that we will also be tasting is a little outcropping of uh, limestone soil as well. So a lot of variation. And it's a it's a relatively new thing. I mean, when we first came to the area, people hadn't really started evaluating sites to the way it's happening now. So it was kind of a case of being able to, to cherry pick through the region and, and pick sites that uh, from trial and error worked well for us. Mm -hmm. So this wine, the first wine of yours that we're trying is the White Springs Vineyard. So this is the one you mentioned, one of your, one of your properties that's, um, I think you said to the far north. It is. Can you tell us a bit about this? Absolutely. So first of all, we have a lot of vintage variation in the Finger Lakes. And I'm, this one here is from a particularly warm vintage, 2020, uh, one of the easiest growing seasons we've ever seen in the Finger Lakes with everything else going on in, in the world that year. 
Um, so no disease pressure, a really nice ripeness level, as you can see from the alcohol level here. Um, so that's uh, right here on, on the home farm. And being a warmer vintage, we did a bit more skin contact that we typically would do with the Riesling um, because the phenolics were, were friendly that year. And uh, then fermented dry at, uh, at low temperature. And your emphasis on dry wines, isn't it? That's, that's your dry Riesling is your thing, yeah? Absolutely. And in most parts of the world, that would not be a new thing. But when we did start up back in 2002, that was a new thing in the Finger Lakes. And we, we sort of introduced this newer, drier style of Riesling, where we do a lot of work with lees and, and other ways of giving the wine some textural richness um to to compensate for the absence of sugar because this is beautifully textural it's really really um it's really rich in a nice way um it's fresh and um, it's got layers um it tasted blind i don't know where i put it i think it's got a, a really interesting um mouthfeel and it, what soils would this be from so that's very much a, a limestone site So this would be like a a loamy topsoil with some limestone underneath, yeah, like like the exactly. Niagara region, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it it's the same uh, escarpment that extends all the way from Niagara. It basically, for people who have been or come to the area, it pretty much follows the the New York Thruway that runs through the area here. And um, there's a comment from Adam Lechmere it says, "Really splendid perfume wine with lovely racy acidity." And Brad acidity. has commented. Sorry, Karen. I just said acidity is the one thing we can typically count on every year in the Finger Lakes. I mean, yeah. we have great variability in ripeness level, and we have to adjust the amount of skin contact we do uh, uh, accordingly. But acidity, we, we typically never lack for. Because this has got a, yeah, the acidity is at 7.8 grams a liter and pH 3.27. But it, it tastes richer in terms of the, the fruit the fruit characters taste a little riper. It's really textural, really impressive. It's an ex extreme case. And uh, so that's the 20, vintage we're tasting, yeah? 23 yeah. years I've been in the Finger Lakes now. This is definitely one of the riper vintages. Yeah, cool. Okay, so let's um, stay in the Finger Lakes, but we'll head to Kelby. Um, Kelby. Um, and with, with, with your first wine, the the Red Newt Dry Riesling 2018. Kelby, um, you've got an unusual background. Um, if I recall correctly, you were running or managing an orchestra before you moved to wine. Does, 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 does that give you a different, uh, maybe um, insight, maybe different way of approaching wine that, that in some ways is quite helpful because it's um, it's not the standard approach to becoming a winemaker. No, that that's very true. Uh, I mean, orchestra management is uh, a niche career to say the least. Uh, and the orchestra manager to uh, winemaker pipeline is not well stocked. Uh, <laughs> so I suppose my, my like go-to glib joke is that uh, ferments are much easier to manage than musicians uh but uh i think there is some truth to uh the the idea of trying to uh, treat different ferments and especially as a riesling winemaker where in some ways the whole suite of sugar options is at your is, is at your disposal to play with uh depending on the site and depending on the soil uh, that trying to express the best version of it is really uh, a key part of what what I see my job as as a winemaker, uh, mm -hmm. and I think uh, it also has uh, maybe most profoundly. Well, I certainly play music all the time in the cellar, which uh, can be terrifying to interns, depending if they show up on Renaissance Polyphony Sunday or uh, or or Diva Friday, uh, what whatever mood they're going to find me in. Uh, but the uh, I think to me, the, the fact that uh, wine is very much a creative process 
uh, is something that I brought with me from the orchestra world uh, and from kind of my past life in, in choirs and singing. Uh, I think uh, uh, even the way I think about wine, I'm usually uh, wanting to express, I mean, I was never a soloist. I always preferred a choir. Uh, and I think that to me also explains a lot of how I think about my wines and, and the different uh, qualities that I want each glass to carry with it. Uh, I'm not looking for maybe a, a single note of ripeness uh, necessarily, uh, which is, is a very valid style that some folks go for, uh, but I'm uh, maybe a little bit more well-rounded, a little more diverse expression. Uh, and I, you know, write the, the, the harmony that comes from that. Mm -hmm. So when you make the individual lots of wine, are you seeing each of those as a component of something that's going to be bigger? That's something that, you know, there'll be some sort of synergy when you blend together rather than taking one place and just trying to produce something just from a narrow, tight place. I mean, is, is that more of your approach? Yes. Yeah, that's very much the approach. Uh, and then the, the handful of single vineyard bottlings that we uh, designate uh, very much are those that uh, become single vineyards because they have that complexity and harmony to them already. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in the instance of something like the dry Riesling we'll try today, uh, that is largely a single vineyard parcel, uh, but it's actually then blended with some other components to provide uh, a, a fuller picture of what we thought the year was capable of from the Finger Lakes. So we talked about vintage variation a little bit, I guess, when Morton was talking about the, the unusual warmth of the 2020 vintage. Um, is the diversity in Riesling style, and I guess when we go to reds as well, we'll be looking at other, other great varieties and blends. Um, is the diversity more about place or is it, does the vintage sometimes speak more loudly than the site? There are definitely years when the vintage speaks more loudly than the site. Uh, and I think that's uh, part and parcel of working in the Finger Lakes. Uh, I mean, the site will still express itself within that vintage, uh, but there are years that are so extreme uh, in one way or another that they can't help but be, uh, you know, at, at least to any of us in the region, dead ringers when you taste them in a blind tasting. Right. Uh, but I would say that uh, Riesling in the Finger Lakes uh, and Cab Franc both, but these are grapes that seem to be phenomenally uh, terroir expressive, soil expressive, uh, and it's uh, perhaps a bit bedeviling, I think. I think people want there to be like a Seneca Lake Riesling style and a Cayuga Lake Riesling style, uh, or an East Side, West Side style of these lakes, uh, given, given their orientation. Uh, and Morton and I both uh, are similar in that we source from both sides. We're kind of the, I don't know, the... Uh, the fly and the ointment of this easy narrative, uh, because uh, for me, soil type for Riesling at least is much more important than which side of Seneca Lake the site is on. Uh, you know, a, a site that is is more shale on the east side of the lake might have will have much more in common with a, a shale site on the west side, generally speaking, than maybe its neighbor a hundred meters to the north that switches over to more gravel or to more sandstone. Uh, and would that apply across lakes as well? So I guess there are there's two sub is it two sub appellations of the the, the um, Seneca yes. and Cayuga? Um, I mean, do they make sense in terms of indicating wine style? Or from what you're saying, yeah, that the map would be really helpful. So we've got the um, the two sub AVAs there. Would you say that really the soil type is more of an indicator of the character of the wine than necessarily the sub AVA? Yeah, I, I mean, especially with those two AVAs, I would say so. Uh, Morton might. Uh, the one thing I could say is if there was a Cuca Lake AVA, Cuca Lake is at such a higher elevation than Seneca and Cayuga uh, that you could there there is a little bit maybe a little bit more acid forward freshness in Riesling from from Cuca Lake sites. Uh, but uh, you know, I think I mean it's nice to have the the sub AVAs for uh, storytelling purposes, uh, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the, well, the truth is always more complicated, I suppose, but uh, that's what makes it exciting to be a winemaker here. And just quickly talk us through the different lakes, just just a quick sort of sentence summary of the ones that that make wine that, that people might run into. Yes, uh, so the Y-shaped lake, Cuca Lake, uh, is historically the most important. Uh, that's where the region was very much founded in the mid-1800s with millions of cases of sparkling wine, 
in particular. So it's Hammondsport where they had Great Western, which was the, yes. is that yeah, yeah, which is like super super cool story that that this used to be a very significant region for the whole United States in the early nineteenth century, before yes. California really got going. Exactly. Uh, and Cuca Lake is also where Dr. Franks is. Uh, so that's uh, certainly significant to the sort of modern birth of the region. Uh, Seneca Lake is the next lake over, uh, which is now the predominant wine lake uh, or wine wine growing lake, I suppose. It's where the most wineries are. Um, it is the deepest of the lakes uh, and the most significant body of water. Uh, it, it has the same volume of water in itself as all the other Finger Lakes combined. Uh, so in terms of that climate moderation effect, uh, Seneca Lake is is particularly uh, adept at that, uh, and the last time Seneca Lake froze over was 1911, I believe. Uh, so, in terms of what helps us get through the winter, uh, there's there's no question about that. Uh, Cayuga Lake to the next side or to to the east of that is uh, is technically, I suppose, longer than Seneca Lake. Uh, it is quite a bit shallower, uh, except for a, a stretch in the middle that gets to about 100 and 40 meters deep. Uh, so that stretch is where you see on both sides of the lake is where you see the, the majority of Cayuga Lake plantings. Uh, and on the south of that lake is Ithaca. So that's where Cornell is. Uh, the only other one that's worth mentioning, uh, just for curiosity standpoint, perhaps Canandaigua Lake uh, on the west side of the region, rather small, uh, was very significant in the Great Western days uh, uh, for grape growing. On the north end, there's the city of Canandaigua, uh, which was the home base for a small company known as Canandaigua Wine Company, uh, which renamed itself at some point to Constellation. Uh, and that was where their home base was uh, up until they sold it to Gallo a few years ago, uh, which is always one of those those fun facts from the Finger Lakes uh, that uh, the, the absolute behemoth of the wine world uh, started there as well. Very cool. So um, let's... Um switch to your wine, which is the 2018 Dry Riesling. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes. Uh, so this is our classic Dry Riesling. Uh, uh, as compared to one of our single vineyard bottlings, uh, this is just about to be released for us. Uh, our winemaking style, uh, along with the blending uh, that we do, uh, relies a lot on maceration cold soaking up front uh two to three days and then uh pressing off uh everything is spontaneous ferment for us uh which can take uh anywhere from two months to eight months lees aging uh on all the lees and then bottled off uh usually the following september so after about a year a year of some combination of fermentation and, and uh lees aging uh 18 is one of those vintages that is a real uh, outlier vintage in the Finger Lakes. Uh, it was a wet year uh, and it really showed the sites that work well uh, because of that moisture. Uh, so this is coming from a site across the lake from us that is sandstone based. Uh, and as you can imagine that uh, in a wet year, that is particularly good drainage uh, and allowed us the opportunity to uh, uh, really push ripeness, the ripeness envelope on this wine, uh, at least in terms of flavor ripeness. I mean, it, it's still quite moderate, you know, 12 and a half or so in alcohol. Uh, but this was picked uh, probably, I want to say October 22nd or 23rd, uh, quite late in the season for that vintage, uh, because the site had managed to stay clean through some pretty rough autumn rains, uh, uh, which uh, gave us a chance to make a really fun expression of the vintage, I would say. It's got a lovely richness, hasn't it? And it's got a little bit of development in a really nice way. I really, um, really like it. It's, and I mean, in terms of the drinking window as well, presumably these um, these Rieslings are kind of good young, but they they develop and they age. Yes, yeah. I think uh, in the Finger Lakes, uh, we often see wines consumed. Uh, I mean, whenever someone consumes them, I suppose is a fine time to, but. Uh, Rieslings from the Finger Lakes in particular have such a long uh, aging window and so many different peaks that they can hit uh, and different expressions uh, that uh, I think we're, I mean, we're still a young region. We still don't know all of those things, but uh, having a chance to see them pass just the sort of like primary yeast freshness is great. Do you 
do you get much TDN in Finger Lakes Riesling? Well, I guess it's a question for both you and Morton, really. Is it something that develops in the wines or is, is this a region that is mercifully free of it? I personally am not a massive fan of it, but um, I know some people like it. I don't think of it as, as a, a particularly quintessential thing in the Finger Lakes. I mean, it's you can get bits of it here and there, but even in our hot, dry years, I, I don't really think of our Rieslings picking up that petrol uh, character of it uh, uh, that is so is so divisive one way or the other. I mean, they can become like sort of like beeswaxy and honeycombed, but uh, and and you know, a savory in that way, but but not the sort of straight ahead petrol. I don't know, Morton, what what's your experience? We have cut back on the leaf pulling precisely because of that. So just to remind the people listening in on this, that pretty much all Finger Lakes vineyards are oriented north south because of the layout of the lakes. So if we leave, do any leaf pulling at all, it'll be on the east side, never on the west side where you get the afternoon sun. But yes, we we did not want to favor the petrol note, so we have cut back on leaf pulling. And Karim, we, we're talk, talking a lot about Finger Lakes vintage variation here and how that's you know something as a facet of the wines. Is, is there a similar sort of vintage variation in Long Island? Yes, absolutely. We definitely have vintages um, that vary, you know, quite dramatically sometimes. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, varieties like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, uh, these late ripeners are not always going to sort of make it to the finish line uh, for red wine, or they or they do, but they're not, you know, as rich as and ripe as they are in in, uh, in a riper vintage. Um, and so we saw, like, we just, or we just, you know, we wrap, we, we just finished the 22 vintage, which was very, very dry. We actually had a pretty severe drought for the second half of the summer. And of course, for, for, for vinifera, that's, that's great. We had sunny, dry, breezy weather. Once we got that humidity I spoke about, uh, we were, we had uh, really um, uh, one of our best vintages in, in quite some time. Um, and, and the other thing of, uh, to, to, with Long Island is we do, we are at risk of hurricanes, believe it or not. Uh, in the next year, we'll mark 40 years that my family has been growing wine on Long Island. And in those 40 years, we've only had a handful of meaningful hurricanes that have really impacted us. But, but nevertheless, it's something that, that will definitely impact the vintage. Um, but uh, putting that aside there, yeah, there is quite a bit of variation. So um, next wine, I realize that we don't want to, um, we've got to keep on press, we've got three more wines to go. We've got time to do them, but we need to keep on going. And um, we're back to you, Morton, for the um, Ardit Singer, Argit Singer, sorry, um, dry reason 2019. So another vintage, another area, and interesting analysis here, pH 3.13, Acidity is 8.7 grams a litre. So this is this is interesting. Can you tell us a bit about this? Sure. So uh, this is from the, the only vineyard that I work with that's uh, not estate grown. Um, I met uh, Sam Argetsinger, who was the vintner on this farm in the early days, way back in, in 99. And it didn't take me very long to find out that this site had something really unique to offer in terms of its Riesling profile. So when uh, the opportunity came up, uh, we started working uh, with this vineyard and we worked with it almost exclusively for the last 20 years. Um, so it is sitting high up above uh, Seneca Lake, one of the, the higher elevations you'll see in the area. When I, fairly steep slope, um, uh, gravel over limestone. And uh, it's 2019 was sort of what I think of, and I'm sure Kelpie would agree, sort of a classic Finger Lakes vintage with a nice pronounced uh, acidic backbone um, and still the ability to, to get the grapes fully ripe, a little later harvest than usual. This was uh, uh, late October. So, um, a sort of what I think of as, as a classic uh, Finger Lakes region. And it's, uh, it's a wine that we typically release a year later than all of our other Rieslings. And we don't, we don't uh, release 
vineyard designate wines every year. They have to earn it every single year, every single site. So for example, in 2018, I chose to use all of the Riesling from the Argentina vineyard for a sparkling wine. Whereas in the one you're tasting, the 19, I was very happy and comfortable with the site expression and the ripeness level. So we, we bottled up this uh, expression from the Argentina vineyard. It's one of it's the beautiful. older vineyard sites in the Finger Lakes going back to the early mid eighties. It's pristine, isn't it? So it's really focused, it's linear and the acidity is, is present, but it integrates really nicely with those, those very taut citrus flavors. I'm assuming this is a wine that you can happily sit on in the cellar for quite a while. Absolutely. The first vintage of this wine was 2007, which is still drinking beautifully. Yeah, it is kind of laser pointed. It's, it's one of those Rieslings you can quite readily pick out in a, in a blind tasting here in the Finger Lakes. We've had another question from Adam. I'm saying, could the panelists generally talk about their oak regimes? So, um, yeah. So, so Morton, do you tend to use any oak at all with your Rieslings? Um, I have done a few ventures into it. Some of it with older neutral barrels. We also brought in some 20 hectoliter casks from Austria, um, but uh, not too much. Um, mm -hmm. We we pretty much stay on the stainless steel side for for now, but we may revisit the the mm -hmm. cask side of things. I'm I'm not particularly keen of putting my riesling through uh, malolactic either. All right, I see. So that's um that's a risk, I suppose, in a larger format that it might still be stuck. In the barrel room and the cast, yeah. yes, it, it yeah. would be. And I I'm I'm not really prepared to to go there. Kelby, do you use any oak, large or small formats for your Rieslings? Yes, we're uh, somewhat similar to Morton. We use large format older oak uh in a kind of certainly a minority percentage for the overall wine. Uh, I mean, we're working our way towards enough old oak for uh, some of our single vineyards to be done entirely in them uh, is, the, is the plan, but it takes an extraordinary amount of time for a barrel to actually become Riesling neutral. Uh, I mean, it's such an extractive, I think the pH is just so extractive of oak aromatics and flavors that uh, mm. uh, it's something that, uh, yeah, we have to be uh, very cautious about, uh, and at least right now we're we. I would I'm in the same boat as Morton with in terms of malolactic, uh, but we're lucky that our pHs are still generally low enough that we're not courting it too often with Riesling, uh, so we don't have to have to worry about it too much. Yeah, yeah. We've we've seen some expressions of Riesling in our region where the oak has taken over, and as Kelby said, does not take a whole lot of oak and riesling for that to happen yeah yeah anytime we get uh i'm sure you've bought them sometimes morton when there are supposedly neutral chardonnay punchins from california that come over our way uh yeah. that have some you know are they're in good condition and have some pre-aging and we'll buy them and put riesling in and you would think you were looking at two by four i mean it's the four years of california chardonnay has nothing on six months of finger lakes riesling <laughs> yeah <laughs> so let's move on to Two red wines, and we're going to start off with um, Karim, your um, Parmenoc um, Cabernet Franc 2019. Um, tell me a little bit about this. All right, so um, this is the one red wine that we make that um, I'm deliberately always looking for the oldest French oak barrels that we have. I'm actually in our barrel cellar right now, and in our cellar here, we only bring down red wine. And so as, as um, Kelby and Morton were just talking about, or at least as far as the subject of neutral oak, that's really the point with this wine. I'm, I'm looking for the oldest French oak that we have. I really only wanna use neutral oak for this wine. Um, and some vintages of which 19 really was not one, but some other vintages, it can be uh, lighter, more feminine, more delicate. Um, and this is sort of, I would say middle of the range. It's a little bit more gutsy um, but still not a big wine, and but I think it's got good structure for its weight. And um, but like I said, we're, we're deliberately looking for the uh, neutral oak for this wine. It spends a total of about um, 
12 to 14 months in barrels. For this vintage, it was more like 14 months. Um, and I, uh, a red wine's the main story in Long Island. Is it, is it kind of the emphasis on reds or is the split more equal between reds and whites? Um, I guess it depends who you ask. Uh, if you're asking me, I, I think it's more of a split. I mean, we're very proud and pleased with our reds. And, and uh, I think um, Long Island has achieved a certain amount of acclaim for its reds, the Merlot and Cabernet Franc in particular. At Pamanac, we certainly would not leave out Cabernet Sauvignon or, or, or even Petit, Ver Petit Verdot. But um, uh, this wine, the Cabernet Franc, I mean, Cabernet Franc at Pamanac and Long Island, you, the expression of that variety really, um, there's quite a range. Uh, so we also produce a wine that we call Grand Vintage, uh, a Grand Vintage Cabernet Franc. And so it's simply our way of declaring the vintage. We don't do it every year. We only do it, we think it was really an outstanding vintage. And uh, for example, I've got some barrels right next to me that are uh, that we're tasting now with our customers and we offer a futures program. And so from the 21 vintage that we're tasting, we offer both this wine, which we call the, the white label, and then we have a grand vintage version. And so the grand vintage is more, more structured, more concentrated, more full-bodied, more of a van de garde really than, 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 the, than something like the 19. But that said, um, I think really all of our wines have excellent longevity especially with the screw cap, uh, won't go too deep into that right now, but, but, um, but uh, this is a wine I think that's great for, for now, meaning it's an autumnal wine. I think it evokes some, autumn, you have some autumnal character there and, uh, and some of the food, we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving in the States. And uh, I think this is a sort of red that will go well with you know, Thanksgiving fare. I think it says something about your free draining soils that you've managed to get sort of ripe fruit flavors generosity but also just at a 12 and a half percent alcohol and with a good acidity i mean that's a that's a dream i think for a lot of yeah. wine growers is to be able to have full ripeness but also with modest alcohol and freshness exactly yeah we're very happy with that outcome as you said you have this juicy freshness good acidity um um it's a, a vibrant wine, but not an over-the-top wine. It's, you know, my two most important um, guiding lights as a winemaker are deliciousness and balance. And uh, if, you, if you can hit that, then you're done. Yeah, beautiful wine, really lovely. And sticking with Cabernet Franc, we're heading back to the Finger Lakes. Kelby, talk us through your um, 2019. Yes, uh, so Cabernet Franc uh, might have might have a good claim to being the grape of New York State in terms of its broad suitability to to these relatively disparate regions. In some ways, uh, Cab Franc has taken off in the Finger Lakes. Uh, this bottling from us is uh, uh, a really fun expression. Uh, it kind of leans into, I suppose, my uh, more old world. Uh, side of red wine drinking in that it is uh, all stems included, uh, but stomped, uh, so crushed fruit, not looking for carbonic uh, maceration, not because I'm opposed to it in principle, but just because the trials we've done with it, the carbonic character kind of overwhelms the, the natural fruit character uh, in a way that I wasn't pleased with. So crushed fruit, stems included, small bat punch downs, and then uh, this gets basket pressed off, uh, in an old wooden basket press, uh, which is all very sort of old fashioned winemaking. Uh, but then the new fashioned part is that it goes into stainless steel. Uh, and this bottling for us is very much about capturing how bright and juicy Cabernet Franc is in the Finger Lakes. I think that might be a, a good way of describing uh, the character of the fruit or the character of this wine uh, and something we love about Cab Franc in the Finger Lakes. There's, there's bright acid, but there's uh, really beautiful berry fruit as well. Uh, uh, I was just just returned from a trip to Sweden, and I think that was the biggest thing I had to explain probably was Cabernet Franc, uh, the, the expectation, especially from a region like the Finger Lakes, where people know it's cold, is that it's going to be a very green wine. They're expecting lots of this bell pepper uh, uh, capsicum sort of aromatic 
Uh, and that's just not really, in, unless you decide to make the wine that way, I don't think that's really a, a Finger Lakes fingerprint, uh, no pun intended. Uh, our, our style of Cab Franc, it can hang beautifully, it can hang a long time, still keep its freshness, uh, and you end up with really nice uh, ripe fruit flavor-wise with some nice herbal notes, uh, but without any sort of like crazy alcohol or, or crashing acid. It's beautifully, beautifully precise, focused, fresh, um, has drinkability, but also some seriousness there in the background. I think they're both, both these Cabernet Francs are, are fantastic wines. I think this is a, a, you know, it shows the strength of this variety. And I think sometimes Cabernet Franc is seen as a sort of slightly secondary variety because of the, because in Bordeaux it's a blender. I guess that's the thing. And it's, it doesn't ever, rarely has center stage. But I think once you see it, performing like this and I guess in other places in the world like um, Niagara region you see you know with a not dissimilar climate you see a lot of Cabernet Franc emerging there that's fantastic and then of course the Loire now the Loire has got a little bit warmer the Cabernet Franc is getting very exciting indeed I think it's a variety that in some ways I think makes more complete wines than maybe Cabernet Sauvignon in the sense that it doesn't need blending you know so I think this is a beautiful example of a intelligent interpretation of sight so i'm just looking at the time we have two minutes left um maybe if, if we have pressing questions we can go longer if anybody has any comments or questions they want to make um either pop them in the chats or you can raise your hand and maybe um um you know we'll direct them to whoever um is best placed to answer the question So do you get to try each other's wines very much? The, you know, do, um, do, do you, do you, um, is that something that goes on, you know, I guess within the region, but also across the regions? We don't okay. get to try enough uh, Long Island wines. Like we talked about at the beginning of the show, it's such a long drive, but within the Finger Lakes, we do taste our wines frequently. Yeah. Yeah, the same here. Uh, occasionally we're tasting, you know, wines from all over, including the Finger Lakes, uh, but, uh, I think we could and we should do more of that. And like we talked about that earlier, we, we should uh, get that going again. And do you, in Long Island, do, do, do the wine growers get together and taste their wines? And, and is that something that happens? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, we've gone through periods of time where we did more of that and less of that. And, and uh, but uh, now I'd say there was a, renew, a renewed interest in doing just that sort of thing. And I think. Uh, Speaking for Long Island, we're, we're very excited uh, about where we're at and where we're going. And also for the state of New York, I think it's it's just uh, an exciting time. And there's a question. Um, there's a question from Brad who's saying, what was the 2022 vintage like? Is this starting for you, Kareem, in Long Island? Uh, 22 is a very strong vintage for us. Uh, like I said, we have this the term we call grand vintage. So we declare the vintage. It looks like it's going to be another one. And that's just based on the, the quality of the vintage. Yields were mixed, um, but overall it was a, a very good, an excellent vintage. Morton? Uh, a very small vintage for certain varieties, Pinot Noir, uh, Gewürztraminer Merlot in particular, but really nice ripeness level overall. So what's there is showing beautiful. I mean, we picked Cabernets late, very recently at very nice ripeness level so uh, what's there is very promising and um just a few comments tabitha says the red new 2018 reasoning was special that's nice um adam says fascinating tasting particularly love the rieslings wish we saw more finger lakes wines over here and a question from nick um maybe we can answer quickly um given the the issues of climate change will you be thinking of planting any other varieties. So Karim? Uh, we, we did recently plant, I mentioned earlier, Melon de Bourgogne. Uh, okay. We planted uh, Pinot Noir, Malbec, and Albarino, all on so, sort of an experimental basis. Um, some of that's tied to climate change, like the Albarino, for example, we think is, is very promising on Long Island. Um, yeah. Kelby? Uh, yes, I mean, I think 
The ones we're most interested in at the moment are Gamay. Uh, we have Gamay going in. And uh, I have a little bit of Shoyripa going in as well as, a, as an experiment, uh, which will be fascinating to, to see how that performs. Uh, and then we, we're seeing tons of Seferabe uh, being made. I don't know if more is going into the ground up here, but uh, there's there's been a, a renewed interest in, in that grape in the Finger Lakes. Very cool. And a couple of other comments. Suze says, particularly enjoyed the Cabernet Franc. Um, Maria says, thanks a lot for an interesting tasting. Lovely wines overall. Nice to see you all again. I tasted the wines FLX in June this summer. They taste just as good in a cold, rainy Stockholm in November. So that's good to know. Um, just to say it's a cold, rainy London um, in November here as well. So I think on that note, um, we're just a couple of minutes over time. Um, so I think in res to respect everyone's time, we'll close there. And I just want to thank our three wine growers, Karim, Kelby and Morton for their fantastic contributions and for these wines. It's been really lovely to share them with you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you to our panelists. And thanks to all of you for attending um, the New York State of Wine, The Elements. A recording of today's webinar will be published to the New York Wine and Great Foundation YouTube ch channel. And we'll share that link in a follow-up email in the next couple of days. Um, and we hope to see you for the next installment, uh, which will take place in the new year on Tuesday, the 21st of February. Um, and if you haven't registered for that episode, Susanna has dropped the link in the chat there. So please click and sign up for the next one. And we will see you in 2023. Thank you.